So uh, let me welcome uh, all the uh, participants to this session on the integrated policy framework. Uh, I'm co-hosting the session with uh, Gaston, who is also uh, visible now, and uh, I'm going to kick it off and then pass it on to Gaston. Uh, so the integrated policy framework uh, is uh, uh, the attempt at the IMF, uh, the International Monetary Fund, to revamp uh, the macro framework. Um, and it's recognizing that various macroeconomic policy tools, including interest rates, FX intervention, capital flow measures, uh, macro potential tools, and of course, uncommercial monetary policy tools are all intertwined and should be analyzed jointly. Um, so we have three exciting papers in the session. The first one <coughs> is a cost benefit analysis of uh, those various tools. Uh, and this is uh, uh, going to be presented by Louis Brandao. Uh, the second one is on the interaction between macro potential and monetary policy. Uh, and it's going to be uh, presented uh, by Judith uh, Temeswari uh, from the board, uh, the Federal Reserve Board. And then the third paper is by Alejandro van der Grote on unintended effects of macroprudential policy on real interest rates. Uh, we also have three exciting discussions. Uh, first, uh, Fernando Mendo from the Central Bank of Chile, second, Puri Chai. Rungcha Rokikto from BIS, and third, Jesper Linde from uh, the IMF. So with that, uh, let's uh, kick it off. I'm gonna pass it on to Gaston. Welcome to the session, and thanks for your interest in this topic. Thank you, Tobias. Um, yes, as Tobias mentioned, there has been a major effort at the fund to look at these issues but there has also been uh, considerable work done at other institutions and i'm very happy that we put together a session where we can uh, bring this different perspectives to it without much ado let me uh, pass on the word to luis uh, luis will have or presenters will have 10 minutes uh, 20 minutes then we will have a 10 minute discussion uh, by this cousin and another 10 minutes uh, for general discussion Okay, we will be kicked out at the end of our time uh, from, from this uh, Zoom meeting. So we have to adhere strictly to our time limits and I will uh, seek to enforce that. All right, Luis, the, uh, the screen is yours. You. So, uh, so Gaston and, and, and Tobias, thank you very much for the, giving me this opportunity to present this joint work. Um, this is a joint work with Gaston with uh, Machi Conarita and Ellen Mir, uh, all from uh, the IMF. And, uh, and I'll talk about this uh, uh, empirical and uh, cost benefit analysis of various uh, policies uh, to win against the wind uh, when financial conditions are easy. Uh, so before I uh, start, um, I would like to uh, note uh, a very important disclaimer that you know, the, the views I'm going to express here um, are those of the authors of the paper and they do not necessarily represent the views uh, of the IMF, the uh, executive board or its uh, management. Uh, so, uh, so moving on then, and I, I hope we can, we really have, can have this, the slides at some point. Um, so how is this, uh, uh, how will I organize the uh, presentation for the next? Uh, I'm gonna try to sh share my screen, okay, Luis? Okay. I, I have, yeah. You should have the slides. Yeah. How will I organize the next uh, 20 minutes? So first I'll, I'll start by um, sketching the motivation behind the work. Um, and then uh, I'll go Can over- you see it now? Yes, I can, I can see it. Yeah. So okay. right now I'm, I'm on slide number three on the motivation. Um, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll sketch some motivation behind the work, then I'll go over the main contributions of the paper, uh, where I, I'll explain the approach from a conceptual point of view. And then I'll, uh, I'll go over the details uh, on the data and also detail the empirical approach that, that we follow. Uh, 
And once I'm done with that, I'll go over some of the main results. You know, the, there are a few more results that I'll not discuss here today. I'll refer to the paper. Um, and specifically, I'll go over uh, the comparison of macroprudential, monetary policy, foreign exchange interventions, and capital flow management measures uh, when uh, both domestic or external financial conditions ease. Um, and before trying, uh, before con concluding, I'll, I'll try to convince you that you know, the, the results that we get are, are robust um, to alternative assumptions. So moving on to the motivation. Uh, the, the main question that we, or the only question that we want to tackle here is to see how countries can react to changes in domestic and external financial conditions. And we propose here a method uh, which allows us to evaluate different policy options and also their trade-offs based on how these policies have been used in the past. So in a sense, because this is a uh, data-based, um, you know, it's a backward looking uh, view of, uh, of how these policies compare to each other. Um, for obviously for a, a more complete assessment of how policy should be used, you know, you, 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 need, you need a model and, 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 and have proper counterfactuals. So we, we start as a, uh, um, you know, our starting point is this established empirical regularity that looser financial conditions today, uh, you know, they can have a beneficial impact uh, in the short term, but they will lead to a buildup in growth vulnerabilities over time, right? And a, a question that is already debated in this, in this context is uh, whether monetary policy should lean against the wind because it gets into all the cracks as uh, highlighted by Jeremy Stein, or whether macroprudential policy should be used uh, instead. And um, part of the literature that has looked at the issue has approached it by looking at the relationship between monetary policy, uh, the probability of crisis and the costs of crisis. Uh, you know, highlight here work uh, done at the IMF, but uh, also work um, by Lars Svensson and, and others. And, most of the calculations then um, in this literature do not favor leaning against the wind in monetary policy. And specifically, you know, the impact of tightening monetary policy of, you know, of higher interest rates, its effect on the probability of crisis is small and the immediate adverse effect on unemployment is high. And so on the net, you know, the, 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 the assessment is negative towards monetary policy. You know, however, you know, this literature faces uh, some limitations. You know, one is of course the, the dual definition of uh, crisis, that it's either a crisis or, or, or no crisis. Uh, there, it, it, it faces also some difficulties in estimating the relationship between uh, interest rate and crisis. It typically tends to find weak relationships. Uh, and of course, it's uh, bound to the assumptions on the, the cost of crisis. Now here, we are going to proceed in a different way. And we go beyond looking at crisis and we're going to consider the entire probability distributions of growth and inflation outcomes. And based on what happens to these probability distributions, we compare a range of policies. So the next slide, so slide uh, six. So how should countries lean against the wind, right? So the starting point of our analysis is the, uh, the uh, 2019 AER paper by Adrian Boyachink and Giannani. And that paper shows that loose financial conditions today imply an intertemporal trade-off between higher economic activity in the near term and increased downside risks to growth in the medium term, say in two to three years uh, time. Uh, that particular paper develops this concept of growth at risk, which captures the downside risks to, uh, to economic growth and uses quantile regressions. And we build on their insight and also on their approach to examine different policies again, as I said, in a backward looking way. And as I said before, we look at the entire probability distribution of future GDP growth and inflation and not just that the tails. And we introduce a concept of a loss function derived from these distributions, actually we do more than one, to compare policies when domestic or external conditions change. So going beyond the growth at risk approach, um, uh, so next slide, I will discuss now the, the growth at risk approach in more detail, and uh, I'll use it as a starting point for our analysis. So in the chart you see on the slide uh, nine, uh, this slide shows a stylized example of how the growth at risk approach is used to assess 
the costs and benefits of policy. So the blue line uh, shows the response of the cumulative bottom 20th percentile of growth to a one standard deviation loosening of financial conditions, right? So, and this, uh, on the x-axis, you have, you know, various quarters ahead. And, um, you know, what basically this is showing is how that tail, uh, the left tail of the distribution of GDP growth is changing in the near term versus the medium term. So what you see when con financial conditions loosen uh, is that, you know, the, the growth at risk in the near term improves, but in time um, it, it deteriorates, right? So you, you increase growth at risk. So the, 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 the tail of the distribution becomes more negative. So that's what the blue line is showing. What the red line is showing is what would be uh, the change in this tail uh, uh, of the distribution of growth of growth uh, over time when you use a policy at the same time. So suppose you have easier financial conditions. If you tighten, you know, either macro financial policy or monetary policy, you know, if these policies work to lean against the wind, then the growth at risk uh, uh, shifts up uh, in the medium term, and that's what the red line is showing. So you don't see that uh, uh, such a steep intertemporal trade-off as you would see without uh, the uh, policy tightening. Now we go uh, beyond that because we have to compare different policies looking at the entire distribution of, of outcomes in terms, for example, of cumulative growth of inflation. And this is what the next slide is showing where you have the effect on the entire distribution. Let me switch. So, yeah, yeah, so we, we, are, we are on slide nine, yeah. So, oh, okay. So slide nine um, is showing um, the distribution of, of output growth uh, when you start without any sort of shock. So that was what the dashed, um, the dashed uh, uh, black line is showing. This is just the standard um, prob uh, probability dens density of output growth, you know, two years ahead. And uh, what would happen when, uh, suppose you have uh, looser financial conditions abroad? Let's say that you know the uh, the U.S. corporate uh, triple B uh, uh, yield spread decreases. You know you take that as a loosening of financial conditions. Um, and what you would expect initially, right, is that the distribution would shift right. So that's an improved short-term uh, trade-off. Um, uh, but you know over the, the horizon of you know, two years ahead, you would see uh, the distribution becoming flatter, right? So the, the, the tails would thicken and, 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 and that's what the growth at risk uh, uh, hypothesis is telling. You're gonna have uh, um, a, a more negative left tail of the distribution. So it becomes more, disper more there's more dispersion in outcomes. Now, what policy would do would be to shift the, the distribution by uh, tightening uh, the left tail. So you end up with a distribution, which was noted in blue, uh, where the left tail is uh, uh, thinner than, uh, than before. Right? So that would be um, what would happen. And of course, you, you, we have to find a summary statistic for what happens to the distributions of, of, out, of output um, and so that we can compare different policies. So how this blue line behaves um, in, with different policies. All right, so I'll, all right, so that's uh, that's what we were. So that's the the black line shows the initial distribution. Um, I don't know if Gaston, if you can if you can move ahead, but probably yeah. So the distribution initially shifts to the right, so that's the short term effect. Then over the medium term, the distribution uh, is flatter. It's uh, there's more dispersion of outcomes, um, and uh, uh, and the blue line was showing what would happen to the distribution when you use a policy tightening. Right, so I, I suppose we can, yeah, we can move, um, right? Okay, all right, so moving on to the data and econometric approach. So how, what exactly are we doing here? So um, we are uh, um, using a quantile regression approach to estimate the empirical distributions of uh, output growth and inflation. So, um, so we start with the growth at risk framework, right? Which, if you if you recall, uh, does these um, uh, um, quantile regressions of, say, cumulative future GDP growth at various 
quarters they had and regresses that on an index of financial condition. So in this particular example, we're using a, an FCI based on uh, data used by the Global Financial Stability Report published by the IMF uh, and a set of controls. Uh, and then we, we expand that specification by adding the uh, policy shock, uh, which I'll detail the identification next, and the interaction of that policy shock with financial conditions. Right? So for this effect, we use a sample of 37 countries, about more or less balanced between advanced economies and emerging markets. And we have uh, a qu a quarterly data from 1990 till 2016. So we can move on um, to the uh, next slide. So detailing uh, the data. So the macroprudential measures come from the IMF database, uh, which was created by uh, colleagues at, at the IMF. Um, for the monetary policy measures, we use policy interest rates uh, as presented by the uh, international financial statistics. Um, for FX interventions, uh, which we uh, use as a percent of GDP, you know, for some countries, the interventions are actually uh, public, so we know what they are. But for other countries, they're not public, uh, so we don't know what you know how much central bank intervened. But we can proxy that by a change by the change in central bank uh, FX reserves adjusted by some valuation changes, uh, as um, noted by uh, the paper cited there, uh, Dominguez and the paper by Adler and co-authors. And in fact, you know, we, we combine the two measures, you know, the actual interventions and the proxy, and we see, you know, we check how, how good the proxy is, and we find that in general, for emerging market economies, the proxy seems to work fairly well. For advanced economies, not so much. Uh, but given that, you know, FX interventions are used more by uh, emerging market economies, we feel uh, relatively comfortable with using this approximation. And finally, for the capital flow management measures, uh, we used um, a new data set that's forthcoming, a paper by Baba and co-authors that uh, measures actual changes in the CFNs um, based on data from the IMF's uh, ARREAR database. And this is an important innovation, and I'll refer to that paper, refer you to that paper when the paper is, is out. So on the slide 13, uh, how do we um, identify the policy shocks? Uh, so we we admit that you know that the, the macroprudential shocks and you know or as the use of macroprudential policy, monetary policy and others is is endogenous, and um, and so we want to identify uh, these shocks and uh, to do that um, we we do the following. So we estimate, for example, in the case of macroprudential policy, we estimate uh, a, an ordered probit you know where we regress a categorical variable. Uh, that we uh, that we get from the IMF database, where you have you know one if there's a tightening, uh, negative one if there's a loosening, zero if there's no change, and we estimate the order probit on a variety of of controls, namely um, a, a, a house pricing gap and a credit gap, and then we construct a residual based measure. Right? So basically, we 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 estimate the the expected policy move, and then from the actual policy move, we, ex we subtract that expected policy move. We do something similar for CFMs, whereas for monetary policy shocks and FX intervention shocks, we use as just a simple OLS res residual where we regress the policy uh, change on, a, on, on some observable variables. Um, so basically our policy shocks are, are, are residuals. Now for the main results, uh, so slide uh, 15, so this, the, the, the slide, slide 15 shows a, a chart uh, where you have what happens in, in, you know, in reality based on our data to that uh, left tail of, uh, of GDP growth uh, um, in, 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 the, in the near term and in the medium term. And you see you know, the blue line is again what happens to, the to that tail when financial conditions become looser Right? And you see that initially uh, output, uh, the, the tail of output growth uh, becomes more, more positive or goes up, right? So reduces the probability of a very bad outcome in the, in the short term, but in the medium term, it increases the probability of a, of a very bad outcome, right? So that's why the line is, is downward sloping and um, uh, it goes, becomes negative. 
with policy, you know, the trade-off is still there. You still have a negative intertemporal trade-off, but it's not quite as adverse, right? So in the medium term, the blue line shifts up, right? As shown by the red line. So the GDP uh, at risk becomes uh, less adverse in the medium term. When it comes to monetary policy, we actually find the opposite, right? That tightening monetary policy when financial conditions become looser actually worsens the, the trade-off, right? Um, so you, you see that in the medium term, the, the line actually, the red line is shifting down, right? So you have a larger growth at risk, right? So this seems to suggest that, you know, tightening monetary policy to win against wind is not the right, the right solution. Now, this only tells us part of the story. If we want to look at the entire distribution and you know to come up with um, an assessment that is not um, bound to a particular tail of the distribution so how do we do that so we're going to use a log quadratic loss function so that's the the first expression you have there where the loss function is a, a squared the um, uh, squared output cap for example or a squared deviation from trend uh, output growth uh, plus um, a, a squared inflation and, and the two terms are weighted, you know, we can choose the weights. So what are we going to do? We're going to estimate the uh, conditional uh, distri empirical distributions of output uh, growth and inflation. Uh, we use that, uh, you know, all the quantile regressions, you know, from the 5th percentile to 95th percentile. And then we're going to get the conditional variance of GDP growth and inflation uh, over time. And so if you just put an expectation sign to that loss function, uh, LT, you see that the at, at any given uh, time period, the expected loss is basically a weighted sum of the variance of uh, output growth and the variance of inflation. Right? So we calculate then uh, a loss function where we uh, weigh these um, appropriately, appropriately discounted um, uh, losses over time, so that's L naught. And we compare uh, those uh, appropriately discounted uh, losses over time with what you would get when you uh, use a policy tightening at the same time, that's L1, right? So we need then to estimate the, the moments from the empirical quantile function, and we do that fitting uh, the quantile functions to a, a skewed normal distribution, right? So what happens then? When we compare the loss uh, function, when you have looser financial conditions and you do not tighten policy, and looser financial conditions when you tighten policy. So the table is showing you the change in the loss function of the situation with policy versus non, no policy, right? And you see that the first row tells you what is the uh, measured effect of using uh, um, a blend of all macroprudential uh, uh, measures uh, available. And you see, for instance, in the uh, central column where you we equally weight output growth and inflation that it reduces uh, the losses by about eight and a half percent, right? And this is statistically significant. The reduction is larger and more significant when you use uh, borrower-based policies like LTVs or the STI uh, compared to financial institution-based macroprudential measures like liquidity um, uh, requirements or capital requirements. Um, and then interestingly, from monetary policy, we confirm our initial insight that uh, using monetary policy to win against the wind, as was used in the past, uh, seem to have uh, actually increased losses, right? So the losses go up by 11.5%. Um, right, so moving on to the next slide. Uh, so the, the, the comparison so far only uses uh, domestic shocks. Now we want to, if we want to compare what happens with uh, CFMs or FX interventions, we need to lo look at external shocks. So we expand the quantile regression to include global financial conditions as a covariate and also interact it with a policy shock. That's what you see in that specification. And then we do simply the same, the same uh, uh, calculation. The table shows you the final results. So what happens then when external financial conditions loosen, and again, using macroprudential policy improves the losses, they go down by 10% and it's significant. Most of that reduction is derived from borrower-based measures. Uh, monetary policy now uh, has a smaller adverse effect and it still increases the losses, but not by as much. And um, FX interventions and capital flow management uh, 
have small reductions in losses, but probably not significant. Right? So we find that they don't really seem to uh, matter most, matter much. Now, finally, some results on robustness. We, we conduct a series of robustness checks. I'll, I'll detail just a few of them, you know, refer you to the paper for the rest. Um, we use alternative loss functions because we use an asymmetric loss function or a loss function that inc also includes uh, um, the first uh, moment of the, of the variable. So not just the variance, but also the, the deviations from the means. And broadly, the results uh, remain. Um, then we also use an alternative measure of monetary policy. Specifically, we used a, a high frequency uh, approach to identify the monetary policy shock. We borrow from a variety of papers that have done that and also some work of our own. And what you find in the bottom row of that table is that you know, this new measure of mon monetary policy now tells us uh, that basically monetary policy doesn't help, right? So there's a small reduction in losses, but you know, it's really not significant. So the main point that macroprudential policy dominates uh, is still there. And we also test for differences between advanced economies and emerging markets. And we, you know, we conclude that you know, they are not so different. Overall, the same ranking of policy remains, macroprudential policy is better. So to conclude, uh, we uh, find that you know, macroprudential policies uh, lessen the trade-off uh, between uh, looser financial conditions today and uh, future downside risks to growth. Uh, of these, the borrow-based policies seem to work better overall. Uh, leaning against the wind with monetary policy doesn't work as well, or in fact, may lead to increased net losses. And FX interventions and CFI measures have uh, small and, non, and mostly non-significant effects on the losses. And here I conclude. Thank you very much, Luis. We are already running a little over time. Uh, so let me directly switch to um, our discussant, Fernando Mendo from the Central Bank of Chile. And it works. Very good. Excellent. Can you, well, thanks for the invitation. Uh, I learned a lot uh, reading this paper. And I jump right into, into the discussion. Let me start with uh, a summary of, of the paper. Even uh, well, so what they do in this paper is they study the impact of policies, macroprudential, monetary mainly, and other, other two, over the distribution of output growth at different horizons. And their main equation, uh, so I, fortunately I put it here because you couldn't see it before, uh, is this one-time regression and uh, where F is a measure of uh, financial conditions, the, the higher it is, the looser it is, and uh, P is a measure of policy, and the higher it is, the tight, the tighter the policy is there. And what you're going to be looking at is two things, and related to to these coefficients that are associated with the policy intervention. So the first one is this idea of leaning against the wind, uh, and to verify if this actually reduces the tail risk. So this approach has the advantage that you, we can see the the impact over the entire distribution of growth, and rather than only the average impact or a probability of a crisis as the presenter highlighted. And basically what, what they're going to be looking for is this coefficient beta three, whether it's positive or not. If it's positive, then for low quantiles of, 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 of this regression, what we're going to have, what, what we're going to conclude is that actually uh, this policy tighten, tighter, the, the, the respective policy helps to reduce the tail risk uh, of output growth. Okay, and what they find is that actually macroprudential policies, they have this positive coefficient. There is some heterogeneity across horizons, but overall it's, uh, it's, they find this result. And it actually doesn't work with other policies, especially with monetary policy. Then they're gonna uh, go beyond this tail risk and try to figure out, oh, what's the overall impact of uh, of these policies, and then there is a role not only for this beta three, but this beta two. But moreover, we have to we have to account them not, not only for low quantiles, but for all quantiles or from all time horizons. So you want a, an impact over the path of distributions of output growth. And the way they, they use this summary study, which is uh, the discounted uh, volatility of output growth, uh, and they do this comparison between. Uh, so I said the the. I take some set of conditions, this X bar, F bar, which are uh, their controls and this financial conditions indicator and compare policy uh, equal zero with policy equal one, which is a tightening of monetary policy, oh, sorry, a tightening of the, of the policy that we are analyzing. 
And what they find is again that tighter macroprudential policy actually reduces this loss function, so it actually helps, uh, while tighter monetary policy does. Okay. So this is uh, this is uh, what they. Uh, these are my kind of main uh, views on the paper, or the, the, the main insights I, I take from the paper. And now uh, let me make two comments and then a couple of questions. So the first comment is uh, regarding nonlinear effects and how do we interpret this uh, change in P as a lean against the wind policy. Uh, first is, I, I want to highlight that this loss, that this loss function uh, summarizes overall losses of a tightening of monetary policy conditionally in no, normal times. So we're conditioned on average value of X, uh, in F also I think they condition on, on average value. I'm not quite sure if they also, um, uh, use uh, changing F. Uh, right now, I'm, I'm not completely sure after after hearing the presentation. But anyway, the point that I that I'm trying to make here is that probably uh, the the change that policy induces in this loss function is going to depend on on the initial situation. So it doesn't depend on this X and not depend on this F. Uh, it's going to. I think it could be interesting to look uh, whether there is uh, whether this effect changes this impact of of of, of, of the policy intervention changes. Uh, in different scenarios, for example, booms against, uh, against downturns. Now, uh, what made me suspect that this is the case, uh, one is this, uh, obviously, this interaction between F and P in, in, in the quantum regression, but also because they already, the authors already found uh, some interest in nonlinear effects when they use some vulnerabilities. Uh, they condition the, the policy, they interact the policy interpretation with, with some vulnerabilities. In particular, I think they, they use uh, a house price indicator, and then they find the significant effect of this interaction. So I think that it's important to evaluate this in different in, in different situations. Uh, moreover, uh, of course, I mean the situation that we're evaluating it is X and F, uh, or these kind of uh, financial conditions and overall conditions of the economy are going to fluctuate in time, and there are stochastic processes. And a stochastic model for them, I think, is beyond this exercise. But maybe interesting to consider some. Uh, in some relevant paths for these variables, for example, the, uh, the F coming, uh, the, the F uh, going down from uh, very loose financial condition uh, situations to a uh, more tight financial condition situations. I think that that could provide uh, some insight and serve at least as a, as a robust exercise. Now, the second point is uh, this, um, we are trying to, and the paper is phrased to, to tackle this lean against the wind uh, policies. Uh, but this uh, welfare, this loss comparison, it's, I think it's, it's more related to a general tightening of, 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 of the policy uh, that we are considering. Maybe it, we could uh, interpret it more like a lean against the wind exercise if we uh, give a, consider a particular situation uh, in terms of this X and F that um, Th that make a thing that we would tighten monetary policy in those situations because we want to lean against the wind. Uh, okay, uh, the second point is heterogeneity across countries. I uh, I was uh, looking for this exercise, so they, they do this exercise between uh, advanced, uh, between developed countries and emerging markets, and they find that there's no there's no uh, much heterogeneity date. Of course, this could happen if we like take down the initial conditions and, and nonlinearities. But beyond that, uh, maybe there there is an, another relevant, relevant uh, cut across uh, countries, maybe condition on GDP to debt or house prices. Uh, I don't know that makes that that makes the policy prescription uh, more uh, sorry the main policy prescription uh, more related to a particular characteristic. I, I think, so my idea here is that one sort of recipe that fits for, fit for everyone, it's probably, it, it's not, not likely, uh, but well, it, 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 it may be, maybe not the case. So when, it may be the case, sorry. And so when, when we consider, and when we go beyond the loss function, we, we take a look at this tail risk. Uh, maybe here is an, an idea on how we can uh, kind of uh, look uh, try to to find which which uh, characteristic of the countries or which particular countries may be driving the, the approach and take this with a grain of salt because I'm not an econometrician but I kind of uh, check how this quantum regression work and it seems to me 
that if you calculate these errors uh, for a particular quantile, saying that the 10 percent quantile, and then look at which observations end up at the, at the left uh, tail of the distribution, that those will be the observation that's driving the result for the particular quantile. And then maybe you can identify a particular characteristic of these countries uh, uh, that separate them from uh, that, 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 that separate them from the rest, and maybe you, could, you, you get an insight about what's driving your results. Do I have, how much time do I have? Do I have time? We are over, but uh, go, okay. go ahead. Uh, yeah, I, I have two questions. Uh, uh, again, not an ergonometrician here, but uh, uh, one thing that caught my attention was that you were uh, very worried about uh, extracting the exogenous component of the, on, on the policy shocks. And I think you do a, a, a good job that there, but you do not discuss uh, the potential endogeneity of financial conditions, which I mean, sort of uh, look to me very, very endogenous because you know, financial conditions could be tied today because we expect things to go actually very bad tomorrow. Uh, so I don't know. Maybe you can uh, can comment and illuminate me a, a little bit about that because I, I was a, a bit confused. Uh, Okay, and let me just close it there. Uh, on overview, uh, paper tackle is a big and important question. I really like uh, I really like topic, and I think it's super important to understand if we should, uh, as policymakers, lean against the wind, and if so, of course, how. Uh, I think that this quantile approach is powerful, that allows us to get sharper insights about the effects of uh, about the effects beyond the average effect. Uh, and particularly, I think we, we as policymakers, we, we are kind of worried about uh, the, this left, uh, left tail of the distribution. And well, and the, the takeaway kind of, uh, the takeaway that I take from this paper is the, the analysis suggests that we should lean against the WIN Act and use macro potential policy to do so and not monetary policy. Thank you. Thank you, Fernando. Um, we don't have time for a a broader discussion, uh, but I also don't see questions in the in the chat or in the Q and A. So uh, let me just turn it back to Luis to respond to uh, this discussion. And thank you very much again. Uh, thank you, Gaston. So I just uh, want to make a couple of points. So um, you know, to thank you very much for your comments. So a clarification: when we do the welfare comparisons. Um, we are holding uh, the, uh, um, the sample value for uh, output growth and other controls at, at, the, at the sample uh, mean, but uh, the financial conditions index, right, is, is changed, right? So we are comparing you know, what happens when financial conditions are loose, so when the financial conditions becomes positive, right, uh, versus when they are neutral, right? So, so, so F is changing, right? F is not not uh, fixed at uh, FR as you had. So in that sense, um, uh, uh, you know, there's a, obviously there's a, a lot of other exercises we can do. And I think you make good points. We can see what happens when the financial conditions tighten instead of loosen. Uh, these are all, all points that were well taken. Um, so, but, but just to, to reinforce the issue that welfare comparisons are when F is loose, right? Not, not when F is at the sample mean. Uh, on, when it comes to uh, um, heterogeneity across countries, we, we, we do have a robustness exercise in the paper, which uh, I didn't discuss here uh, today, and that is that we, we look at an observable heterogeneity, right? So we basically estimate the quantile regressions using an estimator that um, allows for the slope coefficients in those regressions to be um, country specific, right? And we, we basically find very, very similar results. Um, and then on the endogeneity of the financial conditions index, uh, yes, point well taken. Uh, that's something that we're working on. Um, it's not, not trivial uh, to, uh, to um, use a, an instrumental variable approach. And that's something that we are implementing. But you know, we, I'd like to call your attention to the fact that you know, the, the results using the external shock, I think there, you know, the, the uh, changes in say US uh, financial conditions are, are we can safely consider them to be exogenous for the most part when, when compared to other countries, especially if they are small open economies. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luis. Let's now move on to the next paper. How does the interaction of macroprudential and monetary policies affect 
cross-border bank lending. And this paper is presented by Judith Timisvari. Judith, you have the screen. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present the paper. And uh, the uh, usual disclaimer applies. Um, today I'll tell you about uh, my work with my co-author at the BIS, Elliot Takac. And I'm uh, going to tell you about the interaction of macroprudential and monetary policies and how they affect cross-border bank lending. Uh, usual disclaimers is the examples and the content I discuss is the views of ours and do not reflect the views of the board, of governors, or the BIS. So uh, in terms of motivation, um, we have seen very active use of policies um, over the past years and also in the current crisis, especially over the past 10 years, which affect cross-border bank lending. Um, there has been extensive work um, recently looking at the effect of macroprudential policies on cross-border bank lending and also increasingly also discussing monetary policy effects on cross-border bank lending, uh, in particular in the context of the bank lending channel of monetary policy. However, there's been quite little evidence on how macroprudential and monetary policies interact. And there is a good reason for that because they're very difficult to simultaneously study in a domestic setting because monetary and macroprudential policies tend to respond to the same um, macroeconomic conditions, address similar macroeconomic conditions such as credit growth, and also often accommodate each other to address economic conditions, making them endogenous and intertwined in the domestic context. So what we do in this paper is we design um, a unique identification strategy allowed by um, a set of really great data, which I'll tell you about. And our main question is we focus on macro uh, monetary policy transmission into cross-border bank lending. And we'd like to understand how macroprudential policies either amplify or mitigate monetary policy transmission into bank lending. So let me tell you a little bit about our methodology that allows us to better separate domestic macroprudential policies from currency specific monetary policies. So here what we do is we focus on cross-border bank lending in reserve currencies, that is the US dollar, the Euro and the Japanese yen. And we look at how macroprudential policies enacted in the country from which lending originates interacts with the monetary policy associated with the currency of lending. So for instance, to give you an example, an example of what we'd be looking at is if there is, say, a tightening by the Federal Reserve, then how would the effect of that monetary policy tightening on USD-denominated cross-border bank lending change depending on um, whether UK macroprudential policies either uh, ease or tighten. So for instance, you look at bilateral lending from the UK to Malaysia, there's a tightening by the Fed. Will UK macroprudential policies make that monetary policy effect stronger or weaker? That's fundamentally what we're looking at. And we can do that because we have access to a rarely accessed and unique um, um, set of data from the BIS. It's called the, in, the stage one enhancements to the BIS International Banking Statistics, which has currency specific information on bilateral lending flows of which we focus on the, the top three shares uh, of reserve currencies, which are US dollars, euros, and yen. And then we also apply our estimations to two macroprudential policy databases. One is the Ceruti et al. 2017, henceforth uh, CCFS database, and the IMF IMAP macroprudential databases to compare and contrast how our results change depending on the macroprudential policy database that we use. And then in terms of monetary policy, we'll rely on Krippner short-term shadow interest rates given that our period of 2012 to 2016 primarily focuses on um, a period of unconventional monetary policies subject mostly to the zero lower bound. In terms of results, what we find is that there are significant interaction effects. Macroprudential policy easing amplifies the effect of monetary policy. So to use our earlier example, if there is an easing in macroprudential policies in the UK, 
that will increase the effect of U.S. monetary policy on U.K. banks lending in U.S. dollars to the borrower, borrowers in a third country, for instance, in Malaysia. And we, do, we also find some evidence that macroprudential tightening will actually mitigate or reduce monetary policy effect. So this is important from not only the perspectives of policymakers in countries from which lending originates and countries to which lending goes, because be better able to gauge effect, uh, interaction effects on uh, credit outflows and inflows respectively, but also from the perspective of the issuers of reserve currencies so that they can better assess potential spillback effects into their countries. Now, let me tell you a little bit about what our hypothesis is as to what these interaction effects will look like. So what we do in this paper is we build on our earlier work. One is uh, the internationalization, so to say, of the bank lending channel, which we call uh, in a paper we recently published in the JIE, the currency dimension of the bank lending channel. And what you see here in this chart is the working of this currency dimension of the bank lending channel. So when there is a tightening in monetary policy, if you look at the bottom of the chart, there is going to be an increase in bank funding costs due to tighter monetary policy across the board. Now, bank funding markets will increase the cost of providing funding in that particular currency, say in the US dollar, to banking systems across the globe. Um, and then because of the higher funding costs, there's going to be a kind of a higher cost of borrowing for banks to lend so that banks will then cut their lending, cross-border lending in the given currency around the globe. Now, what we do is we take this currency dimension and we combine it with another paper that we have written, a result of which is that mac macroprudential policies act to stabilize cross-border bank lending. So the mechanism I just described to you, if you look in the middle of the chart, will depend on the resilience of the banking system. So again, say there's a tightening in monetary policy by the Fed, dollar funding costs go up, dollar uh, lending flows decline. However, this is not gonna be the same across the board. Banking systems that are more resilient will see a smaller increase in their funding costs, so they, they'll cut lending less than other banking systems that are less resilient. And that's because bank funding markets will expect a higher external finance premium from less resilient banking systems. So this is where we tie in our second um, line of work where we find macroprudential policy to be associated with banking system resilience. Then we say, okay, if more resilient banking systems see a smaller increase in funding costs and a smaller cut in lending after monetary tightening, then our hypothesis is that those banking systems that have seen macroprudential tightening will see a smaller increase in their fund lending costs and a smaller monetary policy effect on their lending. So again, what I want you to carry away from this slide is our hypothesis being that macroprudential tightening increases banking system resilience and as a result will reduce monetary policy effects on cross-border lending. Okay, so in order to carry out this analysis, we need three building blo blocks in the data. I'll tell you about them uh, briefly. First, the uh, BIS stage one enhanced international bank banking statistics or allow us to carry out our unique identification strategy because these data have three dimensions, as you see in the bottom lower uh, left chart. Uh, we are able to see in this data, not only where lending comes from, the nationality of lending bank, also where lending targets, which is residence of borrower, but also importantly, the currency composition of the lending. And these three dimensions make this particular data set uh, um, uh, appropriate for us to be able to carry out this specific identification strategy. In this data, a minor limitation is that the data set is only available in 2012 Q2 forward. And, um, but we do have about $30 trillion um, in coverage in the major currencies we focus on, from 27 source lending systems to about 50 borrowers countries. And as you see in the lower right chart, um, majority of lending across borders takes place in US dollars, 50, 40 to 50%, depending on the exact quarter you look at. 
Euro share is about 30 to 40 percent, and the distant third is Japanese yen at constant at about 5 percent. For the second building block of our data is macroprudential regulations. As I mentioned in the beginning, we look at two separate country level macroprudential databases, the Ceruti et al. and the IMF IMAP. Now, for the first one, we are using the, we have available the Ceruti et al. database through 2014 Q4. IMFI map the longer time horizon through 2016 Q4. As you can see here in the chart in panel A and panel B, uh, in each of these uh, databases, we focus on mostly uh, sector specific capital buffers, concentration limits, and reserve requirements. And um, we select the particular macro prudential tools across the two uh, databases to, to be able to match them up uh, reasonably well in terms of coverage. Now, we are not interested in looking at the effect of individual macroprudential tools in this paper. We're focus on, focusing on um, a broader um, interpretation of macroprudential stringency. So what we do is, uh, as we heard um, in, the, in the earlier paper, these macroprudential tools are coded in the databases to be one if there is a tightening and minus one if there is an easing in the given tool. What we do is we sum across the tools to achieve aggregate indices, and then we normalize them so that if more than one tool tightens, our measure takes on a value of one. And if more than one tool eases, we have a value of minus one. Um, and as you see, of course, this normalization reduces the variation in the macroprudential measures, but you still end up with, as you see in the chart, with a fair amount of variation uh, across the, the different uh, databases. And importantly, we exclude capital requirements from our analysis because we want to focus primarily on macroprudential data, macroprudential tools, and uh, without the potentially confounding effects of microprudential regulations. And lastly, um, as I mentioned, data on monetary policy is essential to be able to capture the stance of monetary policy, even in the face of the zero lower bound, given that our sample covers 2012 through 2016. So what we do is we look at shadow interest rates, which are designed such that, as you can see here in the left and right, shadow interest rates designed so that policy rates and shadow rates are about the same when the policy rates are positive. And whenever policy rates hit the zero lower bound, shadow interest rates are able to dip into negative territory to capture uh, extraordinary liquidity provision um, that policy rates can no longer reflect. Our panel regression setup uh, looks as follows. On the left-hand side, we're going to look at uh, bilateral cross-border lending flows quarter to quarter from source banking system I to borrower's country J in currency C at time T. And importantly, on the right-hand side, our main interest, of course, is the interaction of changes in macroprudential policy in the source lending system and the monetary policy associated with the currency of lending, US dollar by the Fed, uh, Euro policy by the ECB, and then Yen policy by the Bank of Japan. And then we look at the cumulative four quarter aggregate effect um, on lending flows. We include extensive sets of controls, including uh, increasingly strict combinations of banking system, currency time, and borrower's country fixed effects. Now, if you recall what the hypothesis I described was, in terms of what that hypothesis looks like in this equation, if indeed macroprudential easing amplifies monetary policy effects, then we will have a cumulative sum of these lambdas to be positive and significant. So now I'm going to start talking about our results. I'm going to show you our analysis using the CCFS, Charuti et al. database, and the IMF IMAP database separately. So let me start with the CCFS database covering 2012 through 2014. In this table, you see four specifications as we move from left to right, increasingly strict controls. And what you see, starting with the easiest or the lightest specification on the left, when there is a tightening in monetary policy, interest rates go up. There is a reduction in lending in that given currency but on average, as we would expect, there is no significant monetary effect. And that is not a surprise. That's as expected based on the bank lending channel. 
if you look at the second specification, now we are including borrower uh, source, time and currency fixed effects, as well as macroeconomic controls. But importantly, now in the second specification, we also add the interaction of monetary and macroprudential policies. And you see what we, what we see here is indeed, like I mentioned, we find a significant positive interaction effect, indicating that macroprudential easing amplifies monetary policy effects and macroprudential tightening mitigates monetary policy effects. We move now from for, to specification number three. What you see here is that now we're including additional fixed effects, even borrower time fixed effects, to uh, fully control for non-policy related changes in credit demand, and currency time fixed effects to also control for any possible valuation effects that might come from um, associated with individual currencies. There, of course, we can no longer include the currency specific uh, shadow interest rate in and of itself, but the interaction effect continues to show a positive and significant uh, cumulative coefficient. And then number four, our uh, more strict specification, we also include in addition to currency time fixed effects, we add borrower source fixed effects to take account of historical lending relationships and we continue to find a significant positive interaction. In addition, in specification four, I also add, we also include a triple interaction of the monetary policy with not only the source macroprudential stringency, but also that of the borrower country. You see, that makes a difference. The triple interaction coefficient is insignificant, but the significance of our um, main uh, blue shaded interaction effect prevails. Now, what I did here is I plotted the marginal effect of monetary policy at different various levels of macroprudential stringency to illustrate the previous table. And what you see here as you move from left to right is that if you look at a country that has significant macroprudential easing to standard deviation below the mean, then a country follow that macroprudential easing country following a 100 basis point tightening in the shadow interest rate monetary policy we'll see a decline in cross-border lending flows of eight percentage points. But as you move from the left to the right, move toward more toward countries that have macroprudential tightening, the monetary policy effects actually approach zero and become um, insignificant um, at uh, tight macroprudential stringency levels. Next, I'll move to the specifications using the IMF IMAP database here for simplicity and in the interest of time. I'm only showing you the three strictest specifications for two subsample periods. The first three on the left side of the table, the first three columns show um, 2012 through 2014 uh, period to be directly comparable in timing with the CCFS database. And the last three columns look at 2012 all the way through 2016, which also incorporates the period of post liftoff um, in terms of US monetary policy including the same strict controls I described earlier. And if you look at the highlighted area, you see that the coefficient estimates are a little bit bigger using the IMF IMAP database, but they are consistently significant and positive, confirming our hypothesis that macroprudential easing amplifies monetary policy effect. Now, let me just um, mention a few words about economic significance, which is hard to just look at the table and read off economic significance because of the coding of the macroprudential variables. So the way we approach this particular um, question is we look at the effect of 100 basis point tightening in monetary policy over four quarters. And we compare countries with extreme macroprudential easing, like for instance, India was in 2014, with one with macroprudential tightening like Netherlands in 2014. And then we look at how monetary policy tightening affected such extreme cases. And what we find is that if we look at a country with extreme macroprudential easing, of such like India, that such a country will see of an about 20 percentage points bigger decline in cross-border lending flows than a country that has tightened macroprudential policies. And given that the annualized growth in cross-border bank claims is about 5%, these effects are quite meaningful. And lastly, let me conclude um, in this paper, um, as I've been telling you about, we've looked at macroprudential policies 
effect on monetary policy, transmission into bank lending, and we find consistent evidence that easing source macroprudential rules amplifies lending effect of monetary policy. And this is consistent with our hypothesis that we have built based on this currency dimension of the bank lending channel, and also with the premise that macroprudential tools uh, work to increase the banking system resilience consistent with related literature. And uh, as I mentioned, these policy interactions are quite relevant for both source and borrower country policymakers, but also for the policymakers of, um, of the home countries of reserve currencies, um, especially when it comes to international policy coordination. Thank you. Thank you very much, Judith. Uh, let me turn now to the discussant, Fui Chai Run Chai Roen Kitkul from the BIS. Thank you. Thank you, Gaston. And thank you, Tobias, um, for kindly inviting me to, um, to discuss this great paper. Um, Judith Elot, um, for you, those of you who may be familiar, are um, experts in this field and they have collaborated a number of times before. And, this paper is no exception. Um, before I, I um, discuss the paper, let me highlight the disclaimer. The express here is uh, my own and not necessarily um, reflective of those of the BIS. So just a quick summary. Um, so as I said, the paper is a, is a novel and valuable um, contribution um, following what they have done before. Um, and the challenge of this literature is, is that the interaction between macroprudential and, and monetary policy is, is very difficult to identify um, in, in typical studies on, 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 this, on these issues. And the authors overcome this challenge by making very innovative use of the BIS um, stage one enhanced cross-border lending, which is available in um, various currency, major currencies. And as a result, they managed to identify the interaction between monetary policy of major currency issuer, called here C, um, and macroprudential of lending country, or lending system I, in guiding foreign currency credits to certain country J. So think of C as US, macroprudential lending country as UK in that example, and the separate country is Malaysia. Um, and the key finding is, um, as Judith um, said very clearly, when the US loses macro, when the UK loses macroprudential, its cross-border credit to Malaysia become much more sensitive to monetary policy changes in the US, let's say. And the logic is um, based on um, external funding cost channel. Um, so easing macroprudential weakens banks in the lending system, and these make them more potent transmitters of external funding costs coming from the US. Now I have a, a, just a few observations. Um, I think of them as sort of my personal notes while reading the paper. Um, so first, uh, let me talk about the, the first aspect of research design, which I think could be made, made, be made clearer. And that is the, the role of macroprudential policy jurisdiction. So look at the graph. Um, if you like, think about the UK lending country headquarters, and, and this is sort of residential basis. This is the UK territory. And um, HSBC has subsidiaries in Malaysia, and this is sort of uh, the blue square here. And they also have branches in Malaysia. Now, um, the decision-making unit for HSBC is definitely all these square um, items here. But um, as far as macroprudential um, reach is concerned, um, I would argue that uh, only um, the headquarters and maybe branches, um, the blue squares here that are, that are basically under the jurisdictions of, of the UK macroprudential, and, and the branches are probably um, oh, sorry, sub subsidiaries are probably under the, the inference of Malaysian um, macroprudential policy instead. So that raised the issue of, of whether we should be looking at um, just the headquarters office here, which would need um, sort of the intersection between nationality and residential basis. Or more complicated approach would be to look at the, the detailed pairs of, of macroprudential coverage and you know, the banks, whether they, they belong to branches or subsidiaries. Um, so this is this pertains to the definition of, of macroprudential and uh, the banking system pair, which I think um, should be made, could be a bit clearer. Um, the second issue is related to um, the tools and the mechanisms of how macroprudential policies affect cross-border lending. 
um, the paper sort of subscribed to the external funding um, cost channels, um, but I would argue that there are probably many others that you, you can imagine. Um, some of them have the same predictive signs, some of them may, may have different predictions. And let me offer just a few examples. So tools like um, LTV and your debt to income ratios, these constrain domestic credit supply. And you could argue that these potentially release capital um, for cross-border activities. So if you tighten domestic macro potential tools, then HSBC is able to um, extend more cross-border activity because that's, that's not um, under the jurisdiction of the loan of the domestic macro potential. So this would create sort of positive relationship between um, um, macro potential and um, domestic macro potential policy and cross-border activity, which is roughly the same as, as what um, the external funding cost channel would suggest. Now, there are other channels that would actually predict the reverse correlation. And for instance, you can think about domestic macro potential as increasing the resilience of the borrowers domestically. And at the margin, there was an increased willingness of, um, of the banking system to lend domestically rather than cross-border. That would in turn you know, pull the capital away from cross-border activity. Or you can think about capital controls, and this would just limit cross-border activity outright. Um, and this would, all, all these would count as macro potential tightening, um, but, but they all, of course, work very differently. So I think um, the, the, um, the lesson here, perhaps, is that um, we would have more precision to understand, to drill down on the types of macro potential that, um, that we're looking at and, and whether, what channels are they, do they work through. Um, the third issue is, uh, um, you know, about research design is endogeneity with respect to financial stability. And so, so countries, they do not tighten macro potential for exogenous reasons, of course, they tighten them in response to higher perception of financial stability risk. And so, you know, when you see higher, when you see tighter macro potential policy, that could be a signal of weaker banking system. So that, that would go against um, the external funding cost channel. Um, and, and, and so I think the easiest um, answer to this would be to control for financial stability risk. Um, now, the paper already has a number of fixed effects, um, but I would argue that given the short, um, relatively short term samples, in some cases ranging from say 2012, 2014, um, so two years, and then they also add a number of lags. And during this time, you know, 2012, 2016, you see explosion of macro potential being used in a number of countries. So um, I, I have some doubt whether the time fixed effects and you know, the country fixed effects are enough to control for these for these um, variations such that it would you know soak up all these financial stability risk variations so it's something to think about um, let me now turn to um, the key empirical results and, and how we should interpret them um, so this is the interpretation of, of um, for, taken from the, the paper just to illustrate here so macro potential easing exacerbated the negative effects of uh, monetary policy tightening in the source country and I'm just simplifying um, the, the main results from table two. This is equation two. Um, and I, I because, because the coefficients reported are average over four quarters, I'm, I'm simplifying here. So assume that the, the change in monetary policy and macro potential are all constant over the four quarters. So 9.8 is the positive um, coefficient on the interaction terms. And, and this is the key result that this thing is positive. Um, now, my impression is um, 9.8 is large in the sense that if you reorganize this equation and put it, put it um, in, in these terms, then the, the effect on monetary policy in the source country is given by this sum. So if you think about macro potential being tightened once, so delta macro here is one, that is enough to turn um, the negative effects of uh, monetary policy changes on cross-border claims to, from negative to positive. And that seems a bit a bit um, large to me. Um, so it, it's enough to to flip the sign. The authors admit that this is theoretically possible, and this is something I will come back to. Um, that you know you can have macro potential is tight enough that it would turn um, the effects of the source country monetary policy from positive from negative to positive. Um, just another thought on, on on how to interpret this equation. So I guess that. I mean, there's also controls that, that include, you know, changes in macro potential. So you can actually turn this around and say that uh, this, this implies that monetary policy tightening weakens the intended effects of macro potential policy on cross-border lending. 
And to me, that that's that's not very clear why why uh, what the intuition of that is. And I would like to see the coefficient of macro potential of that to understand this point a little bit better. Now let me come back to the this this external funding cost channels with the mechanism a little bit because it, at least to me uh, it wasn't obvious when I when I read it how how this thing works. So let me um, write down very quick sort of partial equilibrium exercise to, to sort of drill down on this a little bit. So of course you have an um, international bank that um, is maximizing profit by setting um, the interest rate on, on the loans on, on the cross-border credit. And they have this exogenous funding cost RD, which is essentially monetary policy in the US, the source country. And they are subject to this external funding, um, external finance premium fee M and M being the macro potential policy stance in the lending country in, in, in this international bank headquarters. And so tightened, um, tightened macro potential basically redu um, reduces um, external funding costs. But I have to make assumption that the fee is basically greater than one. So you can, you can be very safe, but you cannot borrow um, more cheaply than, than the federal Fed funds rate, um, say. And then you have this um, loan demand coming from Malaysia. And this is downward sloping. So the hypothesis of this paper is that macro potential tightening weakens the monetary policy effects on lending. In other words, this this relationship holds. I'm, I'm looking at the interest rate derivative here, but uh, because the demand is um, downward sloping, this is essentially the prediction that the tighter policy in the U.S. weakens weakens uh, the, the cross border credit and all the more so when you have a tighter monetary sorry tighter macro potential policy stance in the lending country. Now you solve this um, by the first order conditions and you differentiating and then you get this um, derivative terms. And if I assume um, linear um, demand curve, I get these two things. Um, so, and this final equation here basically uh, verifies the hypothesis that Judith outlined. So um, this second derivative is actually negative. So theoretically already, this is something that the hypothesis would suggest. Um, but there's a caveat. Um, so if you look at this um, this term, the dr by d, um, dl, drl by drd, it is strictly positive, um, and that means that macro potential uh, macro potential policy cannot be so tight that it completely nullify uh, monetary policy effects on cross border lending. And I, I think that that um, that um, follows immediately from the fact that you can't um, lower the funding costs below the risk-free rate at the source country. So, so I have a result that's a little bit mixed. It, 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 it confirms, I think, the key hypothesis that the paper um, proposed, but I think it, it doesn't really um, back up the, the idea that you can nullify the monetary policy effects. So I think it's something to do with um, non-linearity that, that uh, panel regression probably doesn't capture. Now let me close um, the discussion by something a bit more general to tie this um, conclusion of this paper to to the topic about the, of this of this session, which is about policy framework, about integrated policy framework to be precise. Um, thing number one is um, it is bad news for um, banking flow recipients countries um, in the sense that uh, the shocks that that they're, that they're subject to are very complex. So they do not just depend on monetary policy in the source country that typically people think about, but also macro potential policy in the lending country, and these things interact. Um, prescription in short term, um, maybe you could counteract external monetary policy shock more if you know the lending country macro potential is particularly lax. But of course, in, in practice, it is very difficult to calibrate when you have other um, frictions and other trade offs trade -offs in, in at the back of your mind. Now, you would notice that this paper doesn't really talk about um, macro potential and monetary policy interaction in a single country. Right? They, they come from different sorts of countries. So the, the solution of these has to be at a global level. Um, and these are hampered, obviously, by now, by multi-layered externalities. Um, we talk a lot about uh, coordination across countries on a single policy tool, monetary policy being one. Um, but, but with this paper, now we have to talk about coordination across tools and across countries. And, and this seems um, highly ambitious. Nonetheless, I think multilateral surveillance, such as what the IMF is doing, is a very, very good first step. And it may be time for global policy imbalances to take a place of global imbalances in, 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 uh, in the surveillance. Um, finally, um, and this is an issue that uh, the paper has already addressed, but I think it is something to, to think about for the entire session, and that is intertemporal 
dimension of all these trade-offs. Um, now, in terms of the global credit, of course, you can think about an application that is, if you have global monetary policy tightening that drain credit in the short run, that call for you know more forceful reaction from recipient countries. But if this has into temporal dimension, that it might prevent a larger sudden stop later. Then it's no longer clear um, how to coordinate an optimal policy at a global level. But um, in any case, I think um, we, we would have to look at solution as a more integrated rather than separate, um, both across borders and, and across policy tools. And, and that, that's it. I, I thank you again. And I think it's a great paper. And I encourage everybody to read it. Thank you, Furichai. We are, uh, again, over time. Uh, I don't see any uh, questions on, on the chat, but uh, and no questions on the Q&A. So I'll um, let me turn the word back to Judith to respond to your discussion briefly. Judith. Thank you very much, Kuritai, uh, for the great discussion. Excellent points and very much appreciated. And especially, um, I'm very impressed um, how you tied in the um, discussion with the theme of the section. So excellent, excellent job. Um, let me touch on some of the points that you mentioned. Um, the role of subsidiaries in host countries, or host countries, rather borrowers countries, um, and possibly being regulated by borrowers countries, micro pool. Um, the way we have addressed that in the paper is we have also examined um, the lending effects of borrower country, borrowers country macro prudential uh, tightening or easing. And we have found no significant effects when it comes to borrower country macroprudential policies. Only the only significant effects come from source lending system macroprudential policies, and that is in fact completely in line with our hypothesis. Um, second, you mentioned individual policy tools. Uh, completely agree that individual tools are very important to look at. Here, our goal, and as also. Uh, consistent with the hypothesis is to look at the overall banking system resilience enhancing role of macro prudential policies hence we look at uh, in um, aggregate measures but uh, let me point out that I I think some of the analysis you presented completely valid but concerns more the individual effects of policies so-called the level effects of policies um, which are in, completely agree very important but let me just emphasize again that our hypothesis and also our paper primarily concerns the interaction of macroprudential and monetary policies. So I find it very important to point out that it's we have to keep the level and the interaction effect separate in this particular case. We have to be very careful um, in order to be able to interpret the results. So thank you for that, but um, let me just add that I think here there's a difference between level and interactions. Um, very great point about controlling for financial stability risk. We'll definitely make sure to do that. Um, and lastly, um, your point about the coefficient sizes, relative magnitudes being such that there's a possible flipping of the sign. Let me say that the, in, the, um, in the aggregate measure, even a two standard deviation above the mean of macroprudential tightening is 0 0.4. So if you do the calculations, even like my chart showed, even at a substantial tightening, two standard deviations above the mean, you still get the monetary policy effect, the fact that approaches zero from below. And I would also like to point out that the fact that macroprudential tightening um, not only mitigates, but nullifies monetary policy effects, at extreme values, that's actually also consistent with the bank lending channel interpretation, that you can really see only monetary policy effects in cases where there is a considerable uh, increase in financing costs following monetary policy tightening, that is only in the case of less resilient banking systems. You do not expect to, and you do not actually find those effects to be present in the case of uh, more resilient or macroprudential tightening countries. So thank you very much again for the great discussion. Thank you, Judith. We now turn to our third and last paper.
unintended effects of macroprudential policy on real interest rates and liquidity traps, which will be presented by Alejandro van der Goethe. Alejandro? All right, thank you very much for the invitation. So I'm going to present this paper and going to talk about benefits and unintended effects of macroprudential policy in low interest rate environments. So the views expressed in this presentation on my own don't necessarily reflect those of the ECB. So let me begin the presentation with some charts. So here we see the short-term nominal interest rate and the natural rate of return in the euro area and the US. So what this shows is that these two rates and risk free rates in general have been in a secular decline over the last 30 years or so. This decline indeed accelerated in the aftermath of the global financial crisis of 2008, and many experts, including Blanchard and Jordan co-authors, expect the decline to continue going forward. So here I'm plotting the equity risk premium and the natural rate for the US over that same time window. What I want to show you here is that these two variables negatively move. Um, so essentially the equity risk premium is taken from Damorada that they use similar methodology to estimate the premium as in Rosa, uh, as in Duarte and Rosa. And what I want to emphasize again is the negative movement between these two series. The negative and co-authors using DSG model um, also find negative movement at the cyclical frequency, which will be the frequency that I will focus on in this paper. So what I'm going to do in this paper, so essentially I will take the secular decline as given, and I will focus on consequences of this decline. In particular, I will focus on consequence between on consequence on the relationship between systemic risk in financial markets and the natural rate, and on the effect that macroprudential policy has on the natural rate and on macroeconomic stabilization. So just for you to, to remember, so this secular decline essentially plays this natural rate close to zero or close to the effective lower bound on nominal rates. And when this happens, monetary policy has very little room to stabilize the economy and keep inflation stable on target. And essentially, as a consequence of this reaction in effectiveness, there is room for thinking what could be the benefits that additional policy tools, in this particular case, macroprudential policy, can generate on, 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 on this capacity of monetary policy to, to stabilize properly the economy. And in the mechanism that I will elaborate in, in the next slides, essentially what I will look at is how macroprudential policy by affecting systemic risk will affect risk free rates in general and the natural rate in particular. Um, how by doing that it will allow monetary policy to better accommodate the business cycle in, 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 in the economy. So let me briefly describe how I'm going to proceed in the presentation. So first, I will consider a flexible price economy under less fair. Here, essentially, I want to establish this relationship between systemic risk in financial markets and the natural rate. Um, the main finding is that I will, I will obtain that negative movement. So essentially, the natural rate will, will tank when, when systemic risk peaks in, in this economy. And a second interesting finding is is um, that the, the natural rate will be highly nonlinear over, over a cycle in, in this economy. So specifically in this economy, we'll have boom and bust and we'll have the economy will, continually, will, will continuously oscillate between, between these two regions. And we will see that during booms, the natural rate will be high and stable. But when, when we approach the bust and when we actually, the economy enters into a bust, we will see that systemic risk will spike. This will depress the level of the natural rate and also will generate plenty of instability in the rate. So put differently, we will see a um, high nonlinearity in, in, of of, of, in terms of both the level and the variability of the rate over, over a cycle in this economy. And this, up to some extent, is related to growth at risk literature and, and, and literature of the like. 
So after establishing this relationship between systemic risks and the natural rate, I will incorporate elements peculiar, pe peculiar to this uh, low interest rate environment. Specifically, I will incorporate nominal receipts and an occasionally binding zero lower one constraints on nominal rates. And when I incorporate these features into the, into the model, I find that the relationship between systemic risk and the natural rate becomes stronger. Essentially, this happens because this zero lower, zero lower one constraint generates liquidity traps. This will generate more instability in financial markets because now we'll have artificially high founding cost and also we'll have capacity and the utilization in production that will um, diminish the return on assets of, of banks. So overall, this will generate more turmoil in financial markets, and ultimately this will increase systemic risk and will further depress the natural rate. So all this to say that when we have this, this um, binding zero lower constraint, the, the problem of this constraint itself become, uh, become worse related to a, to, to, a, to a situation in which um, the, the constraint is not so severe. No? And finally, what I do, I introduce macroprudential policy into a setup. Um, here I'm mainly thinking about state contingent capital requirement. What I find is the following. So the big message is that macroprudential policy, by improving the stability of financial markets, it reduces systemic risk and consequently um, it is um, increases it increases the return on risk free rates and in general and, and as a consequence it will increase the, the natural rate in particular. So the mechanism is very simple. So you may think that when we have macro provincial policy and properly regulating the financial markets, then we'll have that financing to finance will be more stable. Our rate output will also be more stable the value of risk-free assets will be lower, and this essentially will increase their yield. I will also find that a divine coincidence between financial stability and macroeconomic stabilization exists, and this divine coincidence exists um, mainly depending on, 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 the, on, the, on the level of, of, the, of the rates in the economy under less FR. So if the natural rate is not too low under less FR, a slight reduction in system is risk will help increase the rate, and in particular will place this rate above the zero lower one constraint, allowing monetary policy to, to stabilize um, the economy properly once we have an effective macroprudential policy into the economy. So that being said, let me proceed with the more analytical part of the presentation. So essentially in what follows, I will introduce um, the model and I will um, formalize the statement that I mentioned before. So I begin with the baseline model. So here I, we have a flexible price economy without macroprudential policy intervention. So in this economy, we have banks and households, and we have a continuum of each. We have two goods, physical capital and consumption. Um, time will be continuous. So we have this physical capital that will evolve according to this law of motion. So this, this theta is, is the shock in the economy and the mu and the sigma are some constants. This capital yields an output and if banks hold the capital, the output is larger than if households hold the same unit of physical capital. This captures these notions of different valuation in financial markets. And um, essentially what happens is that if capital change hands between banks and households, this will affect asset prices because of the different evaluation, and this will um, generate volatility in asset prices, which ultimately will generate volatility in the wealth of banks, in the net worth of banks, and in their capacity to finance firms. So key in this economy are the financial frictions. So I have these two frictions. The first one is that banks can only issue non-contingent debt. 
So this actually links leverage and risk taking and uh, will contribute to generating endogenous risk into this economy, in, in, in this economy. The other friction is a leverage constraint. So this leverage constraint essentially will force banks to leverage when, when negative shock hits and also this will be another source of instability into, into the economy. So finally, we have the households that close the model. These households consume, they save in deposits, they can hold the fiscal capital, and they own all of the banks in, in the economy. So this is all the model. Let me first consider a frictionless economy, so as to elaborate on, on, on the mechanisms in, in the model. So here we have that banks can issue any financial security and they face no constraint. As a consequence, the allocation is efficient. So essentially what happens here is that banks, um, they always hold all of the added capital stock. So output is efficient. And the interest rate satisfies this equation. What I want to emphasize in the equation is the relationship between risk and the interest rate. As you see here, this relationship is negative. And intuition is, essentially very simple and it's the same as in the CKPM. So what happens in this economy is that when risk is high, we have that the safe assets or the risk free claims are very valuable in the economy because they are a very good hedge against this IRA risk, no? And when that happens, what we see is that the price of those claims are very high. Consequently, their yield is, is very low and and, and, and then we observe very low risk free rates in, in, in the economy. In the economy with friction, this same relationship will hold, but the main difference is that risk in financial markets and risk in aggregate output will be endogenous, and in particular, will be highly nonlinear. And this nonlinearity in this risk term will generate nonlinearities in the risk free rate, and sometimes when in particular, when, when, when this guy peaks over a cycle, we'll see that this guy will tank. And I will show you that in the, in the next slide. So then let, let me solve this economy with frictions. So the main difference with respect to the previous economy is that now the well share of the banks is a key average state in the economy. So this well share will be the proxy of financial conditions in in the economy and essentially I will focus on Markov equilibrium. So I, I will study how the equilibrium changes when, when this well share changes. So let me show you some charts. Here what I'm plotting is the leverage multiple in equilibrium as a function of the well share, as a function of my state variable, and also the trend direct output. So I will show you the series in, in the next slide now. So what I want to emphasize here is that this variable is continuous but we can think that we have two regions in this economy. So above, let's say beyond this dash line, we will have that banks are well capitalized, financial conditions are loose, and the constraint will be a slack. So let me show you the lines. So we, here we'll have that the economy will be efficient as in the frictionless economy essentially because the banks are very well capitalized and they can hold all of the capital stock and they can provide financing to all of the firms. So output is at potential, is at its maximum. And in the other region, in the region below this, this deep threshold, the opposite happens. So we have that the leverage constraint is binding. We have that these banks are not well capitalized to provide financing, to hold all of the capital stock and provide financing to all of the firms. And this actually will imply some output losses. And as you move um, into regions in which these guys are even worse capitalized, the output losses, of course, are larger. No? So now let me talk about dynamics, which dynamics are the second element that is needed to understand the relationship in this economy between uh, systemic risk and the natural rate. So essentially dynamics depends on two components. One is this expected slash deterministic component and the other one is this stochastic component. So essentially these charts tell you that the economy reverts in expectation to a stochastic steady state. 
So when the banks are poorly capitalized, um, there are a lot of opportunities in, in, the, in, in the sector. So the sector is very profitable, and that's why these banks accumulate net worth very fast, and that's why the economy recovers. You see this, this is why this term is positive. Essentially, the opposite happens when these guys are very well capitalized. So now the sector is too tight and banks are making losses and that's why the economy tends to, to, to go back to, to this intermediate point. The relationship of systemic risk as a function of these financial conditions is more interesting. So we see that this risk is highly nonlinear, specifically this inversely U-shape in financial conditions. So it peaks around the region in which the constraint is occasionally binding. So it peaks around this threshold. And the reason is twofold. So in this region, the banks as a whole are sufficiently large to have significant effects. So in IRA, they are important sector. However, these guys are not so large to tolerate adverse shocks without liquidating assets. So let's say that you start from this point. If you hit the economy with a negative shock, so if this DC is negative, then these guys have to deleverage and they have to sell assets to the households. And because these guys, I mean, the banks as a whole are large, this will imply a huge reduction in asset prices, which will deteriorate um, the net worth significantly. So the guys will have to deleverage even more. And ultimately, you will see that these small shocks generate big fluctuations in this well share. And, and, in, and in the economy, as I will show you in, in, the, in the next slide. So that's why um, this, this risk peaks in, in this intermediate region. Now, essentially in this economy, you can compute with these two elements, you can compute the invariant distribution. The invariant distribution tells you the amount of time that the economy spends in each point of the state space. And as you see here, this economy spends plenty of time in this undercapitalized region in this bust, and it also spends some time in the booms. So overall, you see that this economy, all the time is fluctuating between these bad states and these good states, because remember, if you, if you have these shocks hitting, then here, okay, they will amplify by more, and they will, and if the shocks are negative, they, they will bring you down. But at the same time, because this economy is recovering, and if you also will have, you will have these shocks hitting all the time, the economy eventually will come back and and overall, when you compute this over a long time horizon, we will see uh, the economy transition all the time among these, these, these points, no? But okay, now let me talk about systemic risk and the natural rate, which is sort of the most interesting relationship in, in this economy. So when these banks are well capitalized... So let me just alert you that uh, in principle, your time is over uh, and just to be mindful that we, we also need the time for this discussion and, and that we will be kicked off punctually at 2.50. Thank you. Okay, um, so I see. So essentially, okay, what, what I see, what I, what I want to show here is this, essentially you see this in, in this chart, you see this negative relationship between systemic risk and output risk and the natural rate. Uh, let, let me emphasize that this relationship is even stronger when, when you have nominal rigidities. Why? Because essentially what happens is that when you have these rigidities and when you have a zero lower bound constraint being binding, then what happens is that you have artificially high founding cost. At the same time, you will have underutilization of, of production capacity. These two effects will generate a negative effect on, on the wealth share of, of the banks and ultimately will contribute to more risk and to more instability in the system and to lower rates in, 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 the, in the economy. And finally, let me mention that, that in this economy, you can introduce macroprudential interventions. For instance, you can um, introduce a state condition limit on leverage. And what happens in, in this economy is that when you introduce this, this instrument, um, Essentially, what this instrument is doing is reducing this systemic risk in the economy. This push the natural rate upward, and in some situations, can actually help you avoid the zero lower bound and the liquidity traps all, all the world. And this is the main takeaway from the from the from the paper. So thank you very much, and I I conclude here.
Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alejandro. I didn't mean to cut you off so, so abruptly. Uh, we have a few minutes of buffer. Um, if you want to spend, you know, if you want to spend some time on the conclusion, you can do that. Otherwise, we move on to the discussion. Uh, okay. We are over time, but we, we, have, can, we have a little buffer in, in the discussion. So if you want to uh, spend a few minutes, a minute or two on the conclusion, that's fine. Oh, yes, yes. So, yes, definitely. Th thank you, Ai Wei. So, essentially, again, the big takeaway is that there is this negative relationship between risk in financial markets and the natural right. So, when we have macroprudential interventions, what these interventions are doing, it is containing the risk in those markets. Consequently, it is reducing risk also in aggregate output, and that helps to increase the natural rate in the economy. So this points to a novel complementarity between financial stability and macroeconomic stabilization that only matters in low interest rate environments, meaning that in environments in which the zero lower bound constraint or an effective lower bound constraints would be occasionally binding in, 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 in the economy. In some situations, um, this complementarity is strong enough to place the natural rate above zero or the effective lower bound, and this allows monetary policy then to fully stabilize the macroeconomy. In some other situations, that's not the case. You might think that in the, you might think that you have a significantly depressed economy in which even if you have good macroprudential policies, not enough to place the natural rate above the zero lower bound or the effective lower bound. And when that happens, Essentially, the optimal macroprudential policy is tighter than what it would be in the case without the constraint, because the constraints and the liquidity traps in particular are generating additional instability in financial markets. And that's the, the main takeaway. Thank you very much, Alejandro. Uh, let me pass on the word to uh, Jesper. Um, Thank you so much for the opportunity to discuss this, uh, um, you know, uh, what I thought was very, very neat paper by, by Alejandro. Uh, uh, I wished I had more time to spend on it. Uh, I didn't have as much time as I wanted to, to spend on it. But um, so, um, you know, the, the comments I'm going to relay is going to, um, you know, I, I wish I could uh, recap my continuous time algebra skills, uh, Alejandro. I'm sort of stuck in, in discrete time models, I wish. So it would have been fun to delve deeper. Anyway, so let me just, I'm just going to summarize uh, the main findings of the paper and then I'll provide a few comments, Alejandro. So, uh, you know, to summarize, you know, what Alejandro does is to study macroprudential policy, I'll call that MPP going forward, interventions in economies with secularly low rates, very clearly very relevant issue. And uh, the, the, the nice contribution here is to show that in a stress situation, MPP loosening will raise the, you know, raises the risk-free rate, the risk-free rate, by containing systemic risk in financial markets. Um, and importantly, this MPP loosening also boosts the natural real rate. You know, that's the key. So that's the risk-free, you know, the natural rate is here, the risk-free rate that is consistent with inflation on target and the production at full capacity. And that, you know, that channel is sort of new. You know, Alejandro's finding here points to a new channel whereby monetary macroprudential policy helps sustain macroeconomic stabilization in low interest rate environment, right? Because a, a higher natural rate, that will mitigate uh, the intensity of uh, liquidity traps during turbulent financial times when systemic risk peaks and help them to keep output closer to potential. So it's, it's um, I think it's really, it's a neat finding and I guess, uh, you know, at an overall level, uh, what Alejandro does is to emphasize the benefits with well-timed uh, rule-based countercyclical macroprudential policy. Um, all right, Gaston, you can move on to the next. Um, so I, I, you know, I really think it's nice. So as I said, you know, I'm going to have a sort of limited scope of remarks here. Uh, so I'm going to comment, you know, some comments on the model. Um, uh, Alejandro, and the timing of your macroprudential intervention. I think that's that's sort of important issues. And then 
Finally, a comment on uh, quantification. So Gaston, yes, exactly, thank you. So on the model, I mean, you, now you had, now you had uh, a graph, which I thought would have been useful in the paper, you know, where you show the, the natural real rate and this uh, equity risk premium. So you seem to me that the model hardwires a negative relationship between the systemic risk and the natural real rate. You know, the systemic risk spikes when the real rate tanks, right? Because investors, they go to the safe haven and then the natural real rate goes down. Um, so I think, you know, an important issue is to relate this to reality. And now you showed some evidence in, in that direction, but I think you could do, uh, you know, further discussion of that in the paper. You're, you're basically, you know, um, you don't write that much about that in the paper. And I think that that should be something that you should highlight um, that mechanism. Another question I had, Alejandro, is in, in what sense in your model the, the secular low rate is special? So I was thinking here, um, is there, for instance, a distinction between the benefits of a well-timed macroprudential policy when the natural rate is low, high in the steady state? So, you know, if you're, if you're considering a steady state in your model where the natural real rate is high and you're hit with a very adverse shock that brings you to the zero low bound, is that and then you know so systemic risk will go up and you hit the zero low bound and mpp can help contain the adverse effects is that different in your model is the economy more vulnerable is there more you know the same shock that brings you to the zero low bound in a state where this where the natural you know in a steady state where the natural real rate is low will that have more adverse effects uh, so I'm, I'm after you know is there something like the economy in your model, does the economy become more vulnerable in a low real rate environment uh, when, say, indebtedness go up? I wonder if the, you know, you have this ADA which you discussed, which, you know, you have the inverse U-shaped ADA function and, and um, you know, is that, uh, is that ADA function making the economy more vulnerable when, uh, when uh, the steady state real rate is low? Apart from the fact that, of course, with the lower steady state real rate, the CLB might easily, you know, become more binding. But I'm, I'm wondering beyond that, so to speak, what, it, what is special in your model with the secular low rate? And then I had like a question, you know, just a clarifying question on the real interest rate gap. Does it fall on the MPP intervention? So I'm wondering basically, if the MPP intervention makes the actual real rate go, go up less than the natural real rate, uh, you know, will be pushed up. So that, you know, that would be, if that happens, that would be, that would be nice. All right, just on the next slide. So, um, and you relate to this paper on the timing. So this is crucial, of course. You, you are sort of considering a very well-timed macroprudential loosening, right, when systemic risk spikes. And, and uh, that's, that's very important because if you say um, the leverage uh, when, uh, um, you know, you're, if you don't time the, the leveraging well, then you could have the sort of the foreign burning and core next simsec effect that average leverage depresses real rates and thus make the yield become more binding. And I have a paper with, with uh, Jack Shen and, and uh, Daria Finokiara and Carl Valentin who shows that, you know, if you do the leveraging when the zero low bound is binding, the, the, the leverage cost can be substantial, especially in a high debt economy. Uh, so you see that we compare here uh, tightening of LTV with uh, uh, when the blue solid line shows when debt is uh, low, indebtedness in the economy is low, and the uh, red dotted is when indebtedness is high. Um, and, you know, so and we consider two-year liquidity traps. So you see in the left bottom panel that monetary policy cannot uh, be cut, the policy rates cannot be cut for the first two years, and then a tightening of MPP can have very adverse effects on, on the economy. So you open up a, a very large negative output gap. So I think that, that would be, you know, the timing here is crucial, and Gaston, you can uh, swap to the switch to the next slide. So I think that, that um, you know, uh, you know, what my issue here is that, you know, if the FSA, uh, you know, talking about, you know, the figures like you show for policy rates, right? We know, for instance, that policy rates have been very low or close to zero for a very long time. 
and you know, if you want to lean against those that build up of vulnerabilities by tightening MPP, when CB cannot provide much or any accommodation by lowering policy rates, um, then the, then my question is, you know, how can your model be applied on the current situation where sort of like a secular decline in low real rates have led to rising household indebtedness, you know, without necessarily an associated spike in systemic risk. Um, so, for instance, think about Alejandro of, of the, the Nordic countries where debt indebtedness have go up, gone up for quite some time. Policy rates have been basically zero. And, um, you know, I don't think any assessment of, of risk there is that risk is, uh, you know, there is, no, there is no super elevated systemic risk in the system. So how would you, you know, apply your model on those uh, countries uh, since um, that would be interesting to to hear your thinking about thoughts about all right guess on the the last slide and uh, then the final issue is just you know I, I i mean you have a fantastic and very neat model uh, alejandro i really sort of appreciate the 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 very neat modeling framework and you can showcase your mechanism as you did in the presentation in a very elegant way Yet, I think it would be very interesting to extend your work into sort of an empirically relevant model to assess the strength of the real rate channel. You know, how strong is this mechanism that you identify? How strong would the effect on the real rate, natural real rate be? I think that's, that would be really an interesting question. If, if the effects is really first order, you know, that is something, um, you know, that would be very important for, for uh, guiding policy. Uh, to think about, for instance, loosening of, of MPP in, in uh, recessions. Um, and I think it would also be very nice in that, you know, if you did that, um, um, Alejandro, you know, how strong would the mechanism be for alternative MPP tools uh, like LTV and LTI, for instance. So just to sum up, the, you know, these were some, some thoughts from my side. I, I really enjoyed uh, reading the paper and, uh, you know, congratulate you, Alejandro, for very nice work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jesper. Um, Alejandro, let me first see if there are any, any comments or questions. I, I don't see any. So back to Alejandro uh, to respond to, to the comments by Jesper. Well, yes, Jesper, thank you very much for your comments. So let me address um, the, the, the comments. So I begin with, the, with this comment that you mentioned about what is special of, of the real interest rate being secular. So here in, in this economy, what I'm thinking is a, it's an economy in which, let's say, fundamentals are relatively weak. So sometimes, depending on financial condition, in particular in this economy, the natural rate can fall below zero. No? And what I'm interested in is seeing is in using these macroprudential interventions, I mean, conditional on this, on this financial cycle, on these states of economy, to try to contain this, specifically risk taking in, the, in this market, so as to reduce both the likelihood and, and, and intensity of, of, of that even happening, no? of, of, of this natural rate falling be, below zero or, or, or the effective lower bound of, of, of natural rates, of, of nominal rates. So that, that's sort of the, the notion of secularity that I have, that, that again, that if there is some problem in financial markets, automatically the, real, the natural rate um, goes below zero. And concerning macroprudential policy, it is true that the timing is, is very important in this economy, but still what I want to emphasize is that assume that you have a macroprudential policy that up to some extent helps you to stabilize the financial market. So you may think of a semi-functional macroprudential policy that is partially doing its show. So because this macroprudential policy presumably will contain this system is risk, automatically it will um, reduce the value of the safe assets in the economy and consequently will increase the yield of, 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 on, on, on these assets, and in particular will increase the natural rate. So I'll to say that even if you have a macroprudential policy that doesn't work very well, the mechanism that I am proposing in the paper should be there. And now 
speak in your comments concerning how relevant is this in in reality and and what and yes in, let's say and how relevant is this mechanism quantitatively i think that this at least is a scope is outside the scope of the of the model and of the paper that i presented today but in principle yes it's very interesting exercise that i should conduct to to, to make the paper more convincing no so i mean just let's say thinking aloud i think that the, this this mechanism is important in, in an economy in which for whatever reason financial markets and specifically risk taking is driving force of fluctuations at a dairy level no because Essentially, that's kind of the, the the force that is generating the fluctuations in the economy, the and the reduction in the in the in the natural rate. But yes, it's something to to continue thinking. And, uh, All right, thank you very much, Alejandro. Um, we are ending just on time. Thank you very much to all participants, all presenters, all discussants, and all those who attended. Uh, I think we had a very interesting session and uh, thank you all. Take care. Great. Thanks, Gaston. Bye.